You guys, I know I'm not crazy here, okay? Or am I? You tell me. Because in this video that the paranormal princess just did, by the way, if you're not following her, you should if you love all things paranormal. She is talking about the Menendez brothers' home. And behind her, obviously, is the house. But if you look in that top middle window, something feels and looks off. So I went ahead and zoomed in and did a screenshot. And I'm pretty sure I see a face. Look there. That's either got to be the spirit of Jose or Kitty, but to me, it looks like a man, which obviously they were and very unexpectedly. So I would assume that their spirits are unfortunately trapped in this home. And in the video, she states that she senses they are still there. Let me know what you guys think of this in the comments. I just need some insight on this because I feel like I'm losing it. And also in the comments of her video, people were saying that they could see someone too. Follow for all things horror. Did you guys see it? Did you see it? It's a pretty good shot of a ghost, isn't it? It absolutely looks like a man. I 100% believe that is absolutely Jose Mendez. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to help support our channel and our work here on this channel, there is a link down in the description box below. And before we get into it, guys, we have a lot of colleagues and friends in this community of people trying to find the truth that have been massively affected by Hurricane Helene and are about to be affected by Hurricane Martin. And I'm going to be putting some information down in the show notes to help out Will Bird as well as Jessa, who is one of his moderators. Um, she herself has also been massively affected by um, this natural disaster um and we help each other out on this side of of the aisle and um i know jessa has helped me a lot with some research um as far as my case with my stalker will bird as you guys know absolutely did a phenomenal job covering my case with my stalker and um i can't thank him enough for, for doing that. I didn't ask him to do that. He just did that. And so I can't thank him enough. And I also want to say before we get on to the video, hold on for a quick second as we give a brief little commercial for our live event, our paneled event, it, not live, but it's going live going live on Friday, October 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. That's New York City time. This is a panel event of, of surviving the dark side of people who have been through the dark occult. So if you are somebody who likes the macabre or you like learning about the occult, this is definitely a panel that you don't want to miss. Ticket sales are down in the description box below. Um, most of the proceeds from the tickets go to the whistleblowers who have shared their stories. This is obviously on Gnostic TV because it, we, can't, we can't have it on, on the YouTube. So hold tight for a brief commercial and then we'll get back to our programming. Hello, everybody. If you are a fan of the occult, especially the darker side of the occult, if you like learning about the stuff that is done in the shadows, boy, do we have an event for you. We want to welcome you to Tales of Survival from the Dark Side. Wow, what a lineup of speakers we have. I've had the privilege of meeting incredible survivors on my channel, uh, Aquarius Rising Africa, over the past four years. And it's been an amazing journey for me to bring them over and just share with more new people sharing their stories now guys this is going event is going to be held over on gnostic tv and Indeed. tickets are, are now on sale they're 50 percent off right shanti so we have a link yeah. below um and also if you want to watch the full trailer of the event which cannot be shown on youtube you can hop over to gnostic tv and watch that trailer as well we're looking to release this panel live on gnostic tv on friday october the 11th 
at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So tickets are 50% off. And yeah. once, you, once you've bought your ticket, you can watch as many shows as you want and you can watch them as many times as you want. Support our survivors. They deserve to be heard. And there's nothing better, more healing for a survivor, for a survivor than to be told, I believe you. So thank you guys. Um, if you have any questions, please make sure to ask Shanti or me down in the comment section, be section below. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you guys over on Gnostic TV. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today we're going to be talking about those Menendez brothers. Where were you on August 20th, 1989? I know for some of you, you probably were not alive yet. I was six years old. On August 20th of 1989, at six years old, I think I was probably preparing to go into the first grade. I think when you're in the first grade, you enter at six and exit at seven. Regardless, for me, I don't remember August 20th of 1989. I do believe, however, that was probably the year that my family moved from Athens, Georgia, because I know that's the year that I started a new school, was the first grade. But nonetheless, in Beverly Hills, on August 20th of 1989, Jose and Kitty Menendez were down by their two sons, Eric and Lyle Menendez. This unaliving would go on to be one of tabloid sensation. The nation of the United States would be gripped for years over what would cause two very wealthy young boys to unalive their own parents. And the story behind this event is as colluded and confusing and conspiratorial as any good tabloid sensation true crime could be. Now, this story has come back into the news because a few years ago, there was a docu-series that was released on Jose Menendez. Now, I have to be careful about the way that I word this story. As you guys know, on YouTube, we have to be very, very careful about the way we talk about certain sensationalized crimes unless you are registered as a news network. So for those who have said there are some channels that can say these words, it's because they're literally registered as a news network. But for someone like me, I am not a news network. So I have to be very careful about the words that I choose to use when describing the alleged crimes of Jose Menendez. Now, again, this documentary that was released a few years ago was about a band called Menundo. Now, I'm not, again, in, in the 80s and the 90s, I was a small child playing with Teddy Rupskin. So I'm not super familiar with the Menundo um, boy band, basically. I'm also not of any type of Latin descent or Spanish-speaking descent. So um, this would not have been my demographic of music anyway, nor would it have been my parents' demographic of music. But it came to, to, to pass, basically, that, that Jose Menendez, as of recently, has been, there have been allegations pointed at him that he was doing, we'll say, inappropriate things with these males in this boy band. Now, I'm going to leave it at that because, again, YouTube is crazy. But I think most of you guys do know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can Google Jose Menendez and Menundo Band, and you will find the documentary that I am referring to. You can watch that documentary and make up your own mind. In my opinion, the allegations that have been leveled against Jose, the late Jose Menendez, seem to be accurate. I, I'm, I'm going on the fact that this is probably true. 
And again, this changes the way that we perceive Jose and Kitty Menendez's unaliving by their own sons. Now, again, I was a small child when this all took place. So I was not paying attention to this type of media sensation. I don't even think my parents truly were paying attention to it, too. I mean, they had two small children. They were moving. My father was building his clinic. So I don't even think that they, if I can remember correctly, were even watching about this this trial or watching this trial on tv unless they just put me to bed early and they were watching it by themselves because in 1993 when this trial was starting to unravel court tv decided to air it this would also go on with oj simpson's trial where they would air oj simpson's trial and i know that the airing of trials is pretty controversial even in the united states of america and most people are pro airing the trials because we are a people or we are a government that is set up by the people for the people and so a lot of people feel like taxpayers have a right to watch this trial now some cases are closed to the public usually that's depending on if there are children involved, all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, I don't really have an opinion on this. I, I could see using the, the, the media and using citizen involvement either being good or, or, or bad, depending on how you can sway the official narrative of what actually happened to cause the unaliving. Now, when the boys first went to trial for their parents unaliving, they did bring up the whole intimacy inappropriate intimacy allegation against their own father and the first trial would be found in a hung jury and then later on they would go on to do a second trial where the judge would not allow any of the evidence of this inappropriate intimacy to be brought forth in the defense's argument as to why lyle and eric did this crime now, I've read in many places that the judge felt like this was because boys can't be um, graped, we'll say, which is so crazy, especially given the whole pedity situation right now that there was a time not that long ago where people literally felt like boys could not be the victim of this type of violence. But nonetheless, that is something that I read. Now, of course, at the second trial, without having any of the evidence to actually defend the boys as to why they would take such an extreme action, they were found guilty and they were sentenced basically to their life behind bars. But since this documentary came out about Menundo, a lot of people are going back to the original defense of the Menendez brothers, and they are convinced that Lyle and Eric Menendez deserve to be released from prison. This appeal is coming up in the next, I think, few weeks or a month or so. So this is, again, why it's all back in the news. At this point, I don't personally have an opinion. I can see both sides of the argument, and we are going to talk deeper about this with Shanti on Wednesday. The ninth i think it's the ninth this wednesday october 9th um on a on aquarius rising africa if that's something that you would like to join in with that live discussion now i decided to go ahead and give an outline of this case for those of you who are either like me you were super young when this happened or maybe you don't know about this case because you weren't alive when this happened or maybe uh you're from another country so we're going to kind of go through the timeline of the menendez family and to really understand the whole nucleus of this four person family, we have to go back and kind of look at both the parents, Kitty and Jose, because out of everybody in this whole situation, this whole story, honestly, the person that fascinates me the most is the mother is Kitty, because as I just said, stated, I do believe that these boys were intimately, um, a B U S E D by their father. And if, if this was happening at such a rapid rate, this was occurring a lot, then um, the mother would have known in my opinion. I don't see how the mother wouldn't have known. And so this whole nucleus, the mother and everything going on behind closed doors with this family is very, very fascinating. And again, I don't have the answers. I don't know what the answer is with these two boys. And I want to understand their mother even more. So by talking about them, we're going to go back and look at their parents as well and how we got to where we are today. Before we get into the parents, Joseph Lyle Menendez was born on January 10th, 1968. 
And Eric Gallen Menendez was born on November 27, 1970. Now, Jose Enrique Menendez, the father, was born on May 6, 1944 in Havana, Cuba. Mary Louise Anderson, a.k.a. Kitty, was born on October 14, 1941 in Oak Lawn, Illinois. Now, both of these families, the Anderson family of the mother and the Menendez family of the father, are really interesting to me. Now, Jose Menendez himself comes from pretty influential parents in Cuba. Apparently, his mother had won like five gold medals for swimming for the Olympics. His father was also pretty prominent. They were kind of these heroes of Cuba. And Jose himself, coming from a very influential family, from what I understand, spent a lot of his early childhood here in the United States studying. So he came to school here in the USA. Now, what I found even more interesting about this is that Jose Menendez allegedly was enrolled in a Jesuit school, a Shmesuit school, as we say, so we confuse the algorithms. And if you guys know, we've done a deep dive on the Shmesuits, and they're not the greatest people in the world. And they definitely do have an agenda. The Shmesuits are definitely part of the establishment, the Aluma Shmati, if you will. Now, that being said, I, I do believe that Jose Menendez does get himself involved in this establishment. And part of me wonders if he wasn't just born into a family like this, but I don't know for sure. Again, I do find it interesting that he went to a Shmejewit school, but that could literally be a nothing burger. A lot of people go to Shmejewit schools. Doesn't mean that they themselves are Shmejewits. We do know that his parents were pretty influential, but as we've known from our friend Jamie Soleil, who was an Olympiad, most Olympiads just work really hard at their craft and they're not involved in anything nefarious. So I can go both ways. Was he born into an established family or did an established met family or did he find himself climbing the ranks and being inducted into the establishment, the Alumashmati? I don't know. But I thought that was information that you needed to know to make your own mind up about the beginnings of, of these two, the patriarch and the matriarch of this little family. Now, when Jose Menendez was just 16 years old, he did have to permanently move to the United States. And this was because of the Cuban Revolution. I thought about doing a deeper dive into the Cuban Revolution, but that would be just a series on its own. Most of you know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about what happened in Cuba. A lot of Cubans did seek asylum in the United States after the fiasco happened with Fidel in Cuba. Now, from what I understand, um, his parents literally kind of avoided being, I don't know, persecuted by the revolutionaries for a while because they were famous and they were kind of these Cuban superstars. And so the realities of the Cuban revolution did not affect Jose in the immediate way that it affected other people. And from what I understand from listening to other podcasts about Jose and it, you know, who is to know, this is just coming from different eyewitness witness accounts who knew Jose at 16, when he moved to the United States, he was not happy about it. He did not want, even though he had already been going to school in the United States, the fact that he could not get back to his home, I, I don't doubt that that wasn't traumatic. Like I, you know, look at what we're going through right now here in an hour in, in, in the United States with these hurricanes. Like I, the reality of having your government pursue you must be terrifying. And to have to leave your homeland behind because you're not safe there, again, must be terrifying. So I can definitely feel some empathy for Jose as a child. And, and I try to make that distinction with all of these characters in this establishment, these Aluma Shmati families, is that when they're children, I definitely have a lot of empathy for them. But as they become adults and they tr start to make these actions themselves and they intentionally start to perpetrate this type of harm, I then lose my empathy for them. But for a 16-year-old Jose, I can definitely, definitely feel a lot of empathy. Now, it has been alleged, though, that Jose himself did experience a lot of ABUSC 
in the intimate department with his own family as a child. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, or if that's just hearsay, but I thought it was important just to bring up nonetheless. Now, again, Jose's mother was a very accomplished swimmer, and it seems that Jose himself also was a very accomplished swimmer because Jose landed a swimming scholarship to Southern Illinois University. And it is here at Southern Illinois University that Jose met an older woman, Kitty Kitty Anderson was a few years older than Jose because she too was a student at Southern Illinois University where she was studying communications. You see, Kitty was known to be this drop dead gorgeous woman as a young woman. She was the youngest of four in her family. Her parents were Charles and May Anderson and they were pretty middle class, whereas Jose even though Jose pretty much lost everything at 16 with the Cuban Revolution, he had, however, grown up in a pretty prominent family in Cuba, given that his parents were kind of Cuban, Cuban superstars. But Kitty herself grew up, again, in a very all-American, middle-class family. Again, she was the youngest of four. Her father, Charles, owned a heating and air conditioning business, and it is reported that Charles himself was very... A-B-U-S-I-V-E, to both May, his wife, and his children. Now, as there is speculation that Jose went through S-A, went through intimacy violence, it is more speculated that Kitty went through more physical and maybe verbal and emotional violence. Not negating the two, but it's just interesting that we have these two people who grew up in a very... Um, chaotic home where some sort of ABUSC was definitely um, prevalent or there's accusations of it being prevalent in different ways. And obviously we know that if you experience that as a child, the PTSD from that will change you. We also know that people tend to repeat their um, upbringing, their karma from their upbringing until they actually heal themselves. Only then can they find new patterns of living. Well, again, I told you that Kitty herself was a beautiful young lady and her parents did eventually divorce, which is a good thing because it got the children and the mother away from this toxic environment. But again, this is, you know, the 1950s and 60s divorce was not as common. So I can't negate that probably was very traumatic for Kitty herself, because even though your family is toxic, it doesn't take away from the fact that you become kind of the oddball when your parents actually divorce in a time when divorce isn't common. Now, Kitty herself being this beautiful young woman, it is stated that she very much wanted to be a movie star or a news anchor. And maybe she did have an actual love for media, but part of me feels like she was looking for attention, um, positive affirmation that you would assume a movie star or a news anchor would get because she probably wasn't getting much of that at home. Again, being the youngest of four in a very middle class family where now her parents are divorced, his father, obvi her father obviously didn't treat her, her siblings or her mother well. And so I just can't help but wonder if that's why Kitty wanted to be a movie star or or wanted to be a news anchor because she was looking for more of a grandiose way to to receive affection for people that from people that she did not receive the love that she did not receive in her childhood. Now, in 1962, Kitty did win a beauty contest. So it's not just the fact that her friends say she was beautiful. She won a beauty contest. So she was definitely a very attractive girl. And she definitely caught the eye of the younger Jose Menendez. Now, what's interesting is both Jose and the Menendez family and the Anderson family did not think that this marriage was appropriate and it had nearly nothing to do with the age difference because they were only their age difference was only by a couple of years it's still as a side note i know i've said this before in other in other shows it always i always get kind of baffled in relationships where the woman is older i've always dated older i mean my boyfriend's 11 years older than me i my ex is 15 years older than me like i've always been attracted to older men and in my mind, that's that's like appropriate to have a man that's older. But it's always funny to me when women are older because I don't know. I guess it's just maybe it was how I my, my mother was a year older than my dad. But I don't know. That's just 
it's always funny to me that that women are in some relationships are older. Maybe it's because for me personally, I want to feel taken care of by a man. Like I want to feel protected by a man as a woman. And if I'm the older one, then maybe I feel like I'm the one that has to be the protector. I, I don't know. That's let the psychiatrist have fun with that one with me. But um, but nonetheless, Kitty was only a few years older than Jose. So they were age appropriate for each other. So that really wasn't the issue that the families were having with this union. Um, it seems like there were just a lot of c concerns because, A, they were really young. Uh, even though back then people got married younger, it was still pretty young. They were still in school, you know. And I think the fact that Jose was a refugee, basically, he had escaped this Cuban revolution. He had a, as the man of the family, there was a lot of stress now on him to be a, if he was going to be a husband, it, to support his wife. When, even though he came from a very affluent family, he did not have that money once the revolution started. And so here's this young immigrant refugee to the United States that um, now has to support a, a family. But nonetheless, uh, Jose and Kitty ran off, they eloped, and they got married. Well, soon after they got married, Kitty was done with school, but Jose was not. And after that, the couple decided to move to New York City. So in 1963, they married and packed up and moved to New York. Again, Kitty herself was finished with her academic work, her school, but Jose was only 19. He was still... I mean, gosh, you guys, 19, that's like a kid. He was still a ways away from being through with his education. And so to move to New York City, they moved in with some of Jose's family members into an apartment and Jose transferred to Queens College to finish his education. It seems that a lot of people want to call Jose Menendez a rags to riches story. And I definitely can see why they would have this opinion because when Jose first married Kitty and moved to New York City, um, while he was still in school, he did work as a dishwasher as a part-time job to supplement some sort of income for him and his new wife. Although, again, I can see why people says, say it's a rag to riches story, but let's not forget that Jose did grow up with a silver spoon in his mouth. So it wasn't like he was achieving for something he didn't already understand or know. He was achieving to get back the wealth that he had grown up with, that his parents had lost, not to any fault of their own, but because of the Cuban Revolution. So I definitely believe that at this time of Jose's life, when he was working as a dishwasher and going to school part time was probably a very humiliating time of Jose's life. Definitely listening to podcasts about Jose. Uh, most people say he was not a very nice man. He was a very narcissistic man. Um, and I definitely can see that this would drive him crazy being this lowly dishwasher. And Kitty, his wife, was working at a, as a school teacher at this time. So she was definitely the one that was bringing in the bacon, as they say. Um, she was the one that was making the most money, but, but she wasn't in school, right? She had finished. So he was a part-time student and a part-time dishwasher. Moreover, over time, the couple did manage to make enough money where they were able to move out on their own as a young married couple. And in 1968, again, in 1968, their first son, Joseph Lyle Menendez, was born. Now, it is speculated that he was named after his father, as Jose might potentially be the Spanish way of saying Joseph. But nonetheless, they did give him a very English name. I can't help but notice that. That might have something to do with the fact um, that of the time period they lived in. And maybe they felt like their boys would have a better shot at life if they did have more Anglican names, especially with the last name of Menendez. Um, or maybe it's just to honor the fact that Kitty herself was an Anglican. She was a white chick, right? Her maiden name was Anderson. So I, I don't know. I just felt that was kind of interesting. I'm sure there's some psychology there as to why he was called Joseph Lyle Menendez and not Jose Lyle Menendez, because as we know, he does end up going by his middle name, Lyle. And again, this was 1968. So at this time, even though the woman that Jose had married was a go-getter, she was a woman who wasn't afraid to work. She got her college, her university education at a time where it still was kind of strange for women to go to university, not as abnormal as generations before, but still wasn't super common for a woman to get a university degree. And she wanted to be an actress and she wanted to be on the TV. These dreams didn't change just because she got married. However, when she had Lyle, everything changed. 
because at the urging of Jose, he really wanted his wife, Kitty, to be the traditional stay-at-home housewife. Now, at this time, Jose was starting to make a name for himself. It turns out that when you are a narcissistic megalomaniac, you're pretty good at business. You know, that dog-eat-dog world is pretty much made for you. So, um... Jose climbed the corporate la ladder pretty quickly. So it did afford Kitty the opportunity to be a housewife. And honestly, the older I get, the more I would appreciate being a housewife. There's this really funny Ali Wong stand up, this hysterical one where she talks about how housewives are the smartest women among us and she talks about how when her and her friends go out in LA to go for a walk and their her friends start you know they start talking down to these other women they see who are obviously housewives because they're out in their Lululemons in the middle of the day just taking walks and lunching and Ali Wong was like that woman's ge genius she's not a housewife she's retired she figured out how to live her best life by being the housewife and I I totally get that so you know for someone like Kitty, I could definitely see where it would be bittersweet to give up your dreams. But you've got this child now and you've got a husband who is making enough money to definitely afford you probably a way better life at this point than Kitty had had, had growing up. Because again, once Jose got into the working world after he was done with his college, he did rise in ranks pretty rapidly. Um, and was able to bring in quite a nice income. And then, of course, two years later, in 1970, uh, the youngest brother, Eric, was born. And these boys, they were able to send them to private schools. They were living in New Jersey. They had moved into the suburbs of New Jersey. And so they were able to send them to like a Princeton day school. Private schools, little kids. Private schools cost a lot of money. I grew up in a private school. I still am like shocked that even my parents, parents will spend that much money to send their kids to private schools. It's not something to scoff at. So we do know that from the get-go of the birth of these boys, that there was a lot of money floating around the house. Now, Jose's job title is more like business executive. And I, I actually don't like those job titles because they can kind of, it's like kind of a catch-all phrase for a high-powered businessman. And in business is business, right? It doesn't matter if you're you're selling toilets or if you're selling musicians. It's business, right? It's about the numbers. And if you're good at numbers and you're good at striking deals, regardless of what the product is, you're probably going to succeed. And and one of the podcasts that I listened to that they they talked about how driven Jose was to be this powerful, wealthy businessman. That it didn't matter what the product was, like. He, if he was going to be be uh, selling lipstick, he would go into the job knowing nothing about lipstick, but he would study his ass off to make sure that he learned everything there was about lipstick so that he could be the best lipstick seller in the business. It was more about Jose fulfilling his own needs and his own ego and probably a lot to do with the trauma of his childhood in Cuba that really kept him going. For example, he's worked for Hertz Global, you know, like the cars, the Hertz cars. And then he ended up working for RCA Holdings. And this is where we start to get the music coming in. Because now Jose feels like he can step into a, a job where he is going to make even more money basically handling and managing and selling musicians and i, I want to be clear like even though there's obviously very nefarious stuff that happens in the music industry aka the stuff going on with puff daddy and you know of course the documentary about jose menendez and Men the menendo band from you know the, the the latin american band but when i talk about like the management of music i, I want to be very clear because as we move forward into our new world as, as we start to clean things up when it comes to this nefarious group we can't negate the fact that people who are good at selling are going to be good at managing record labels and managing artists and a lot of times like for myself like right now i personally am in the process of actually finding an agent and a manager for my youtube channel my boyfriend and i had a long discussion about it and i feel like i need 
I need representation at this point because it's getting so overwhelming and the jobs are getting so overwhelming that I can't do it all. And as someone myself who's really creative and likes to story tell, I'm not good at the business side of running um, Esoteric Atlanta. You know, I'm better at just creating my art, creating my stories, creating my shows. I don't want to have to deal with like sponsorships and all that kind of stuff. So having like an agent or a manager is something that helps me help my own business and agents and managers. So just so you guys know, they don't, you don't pay them. They make money when you make money. So if you have, for example, if I get, when I get my agent, um, if I get a sponsorship deal, let's say I get a sponsorship deal with the company to do like five commercials on my show to help fund my show. The agent who got that, that brand deal for me will get like 10 to 20% of the payments. Right. And so it's when people take on these, these agents or these management, they're not paying anything. You're working in like a cohesive relationship to help. They're helping you sell your product, which is your yourself really in, in not a nefarious way, right? Like that's an energy exchange. Every person who's an artist needs to have, they're giving their art to the world. They need to have their, that reciprocated through payment so that they can actually continue to create their art. So I want to be very clear about that. So I can't take away from the fact that Jose was really good at this kind of stuff because that's like someone, like I said, that's, that's an art in itself to be able to, to take a brand, a band and manage them to the point where they're able to make a living that you are the one selling them. They're selling the music in order to get them produced. To so this part of the, the industry of having managers, having agents, that in itself is not corrupt. It's necessary. It's absolutely necessary for people like me who are artists who are really shitty at like, I'm really bad at like numbers, you know, and like doing business deals. And I'm the type of person that will do everything for free at the detriment to myself because I love what I do. I need someone to step in and say, no, she needs to be paid for this. Let's do a brand deal. I need that bulldog. Like I need somebody that's going to represent me in that way. And so someone like Jose Menendez is obviously really good at being that bulldog. He's good at business. Even if he likes the music or not, he can sell it. He can sell probably sell ice to the Eskimos. And because Jose Menendez himself is Latin, he's from Cuba, he's not Puerto Rican, but he's still Latin. He's able to watch these trends as a good businessman. He was able to watch these trends in the music world and see that this, this genre of music, Latin pop, Latin music, was about to take off in the United States. And so it's kind of like multi-level marketing. Like if you can get up at the top, if you can be the first one in, you're going to have success. And so he went and basically got himself a position with music labels because he was able with his past reputation of being so good at business, he was able to spot trends and patterns and he was able to do that with music. And so he was able to do things like get bands. There's other big bands that you would recognize that Jose Menendez was actually behind. So if you go and look at his resume, you're going to see a lot of stuff that you recognize that wouldn't be recognizable to you without Jose Menendez being the businessman behind this particular artistic group. Now, that does not excuse his behavior, his SRA, his SA of these boys. That does not excuse it, that the two, you know, two things can be true. He could be an absolute bulldog and an agent that any artist would want on their side to help them get deals. But he could also be the devil in disguise taking advantage of these artists. Two things can be true. So when he starts to make these deals and starts to move forward with the Menudo band and, and his new job where he's making even more money now because it's an entertainment, he decides in 1986 that he is going to move his family from the East Coast to the West Coast, to California. Now, first they moved to the suburbs of Calabasas. And most of you guys, if you're familiar with the Kardashians, you know where Calabasas is because that's where they lived at the beginning of their reality show. It's a very wealthy kind of suburb of LA. I lived in LA for a while. I never went to Calabasas, but I know where it is. And a lot of very prosperous people live in Calabasas. Now there is speculation that the boys themselves were getting into trouble, breaking and entering stupid stuff that kids whose parents are millionaires don't need to be doing. And for me, this obviously their legal issues with breaking and entering probably were a sign of begging for help. Because I do believe they were being intimately 
violated by their father for their whole lives. I absolutely do. And I think they were being physically and emotionally and verbally also violated as well. Um, I don't think it was just SA or, you know, intimacy. I think that they were just full on being A, B, U, S, E, D. I, I, I think this was a problem in the Menendez house. And so as the boys were getting older, they, they're being taken from their family and their friends in the East Coast. And now they're moved to this new area in the West Coast. I absolutely think it was a call for help. But nonetheless, they ended up moving the boys from Calabasas directly to Beverly Hills. Now, at the time of the moving, Lyle was 18 and Eric was 16. So Lyle was absolutely done with his high school education, looking more towards college. And I do believe he did do a little time um, at Princeton at the Ivy League school before the the unaliving before August 20th of 1989, there was some issues with plagiarism, all that kind of stuff. Again, I do think that was an outcry of help. I think these boys had been displaying behaviors that they needed help um, and help was just not being provided. Now, Eric was 16 when they moved to Beverly Hills. And so he en enrolled at Beverly Hills High School, which is a very famous high school that a lot of very wealthy children, a lot of children of actors, all that kind of stuff went to. Now, it's interesting because Beverly High Hills High School is full of a bunch of exceedingly wealthy children. We look at country club sports. Now, I grew up being forced to play tennis. I hate tennis. My sister was really good at tennis. She actually played in the U.S. Australian Junior Opens in the early 2000s. That's why I spent a lot of time in Australia. Love Australia. But tennis is definitely a country club sport. And Eric um, ended up being rank, ranked 44th in the nation in the tennis he was an incredible tennis player like an incredible tennis player and you know with sports with anything in general if you love something and, and i believe if you want to do something and you put your mind to it you can do do whatever you want but there is a point in any type of craft where there is raw talent so even if you have raw talent you still need to to nurture that talent and work at it and we know eric was very very strict with his um coach and really worked on his craft of tennis but there was definitely raw talent there as well there's a lot of thinking in tennis a lot of placing the ball fast thinking fast moving so um that's pretty impressive that he had this ability to be this athletic in the game of tennis now if you watch the latest uh I think it's Netflix monsters. I've watched part of it. They show scenes where Jose throws temper tantrums at tennis um, events because Eric would mess up. And a lot of people say that's exaggerated. And I, I agree with that because tennis, like golf, if it's a country club sport, it's a very quiet sport. If you, it's not, there's no screaming and yelling and shouting like there is in like basketball or football. It's very uh, quiet. So it's, you, you, you can hear the ball being hit back and forth and people clap after there's a score. You don't see a lot of people pitching fits. And if you do see that, usually they are removed from the stadium. So I don't think that Jose would have actually done that at the stadium or at the, at the court, at the tennis court, um, because a, he wanted to give this appearance of being this very wealthy elite family. And so there's certain behaviors that you display in public if you're of this certain caliber of people, especially at sport, like country club sports like tennis or golf. But I have no doubt that Jose might have thrown temper tantrums about mistakes Eric made in tennis matches back at the house. That wouldn't surprise me at all. You know, that any dropping of the ball or any uh, points scored against Eric, I'm sure would have been completely scrutinized by someone like Jose Menendez. So I just wanted to make that clear with that Monsters documentary. I don't believe that there was ever a, a situation where Jose displayed his violent tendencies at a public tennis match. It probably again happened at their house afterwards. Now, as Jose became more and more powerful and richer and richer and richer he definitely um displayed his power in more ways the boy who had been head over heels in love with the young beauty queen from his university turned into a man that was never faithful jose had allegedly a lot of mistresses including a long-standing mistress for eight years in new york city now the show monsters going over Lyle and Eric Menendez stories do claim that Jose himself was bisexual, 
Um, I'm not so sure that I believe he was bisexual. I do know that he was involved in certain rituals in voiding, uh, uh, involving the graping of little boys and boys in the um, the music, the, the record label. But the reason why I say I'm not convinced he was actually bisexual is because I believe that what Jose, in my personal opinion, as it stands right now, what I believe Jose Menendez was doing was actual ritual, satanic ritual. And there is a difference between satanic ritual and intimacy on a consensual level, if that makes sense. Again, I'm trying to be very careful with how I say this, guys. I wish I could just say the words, but I can't say the words because of YouTube. Um, so I don't think that Jose was necessarily, in my personal opinion, and I'm, my, my opinion might change on this. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know if he was actually attracted to men that way, like the way monsters describe it, or if this was just something he did for his religious purposes. Because we know that grape was involved. So if grape, you guys know what I'm saying when I say grape, if grape was involved, then it wasn't consensual. And there is a dominating factor there. And if the boys are younger, then it's taking that life force through this actual ritual. So, and you know, there, there's a lot of bisexual people out there, but being bisexual isn't a bad thing. And there are a lot of people who are in marriages where one of the partners is bisexual and they have open I've talked about my belief of open relationships. I'm not really into that, but, but, you know, to each their own. And, but even if there is an affair outside of the relationship, if you're a man who's bisexual and you're married to a woman and you have an affair outside of the, the marriage with another man, even if it's not open, that other man is probably an adult and it's consensual between the two men, if that makes sense. Whereas this, we're not seeing any signs of that. So that's kind of why I have the opinion that Jose was not actually bisexual, but was more acting out his religious beliefs. Because most of the people that we know he had affairs with were women. So I don't know. If you want to talk about that in the comment section, just be really careful with how you talk about that because YouTube does not like the subject at all. Anyway, as... Jose became more and more and more powerful. Kitty became more and more and more depressed. I don't think, again, as I said, stated at the beginning of this video, one of the people in this whole situation that I'm the most fascinated with is Kitty, because I don't understand how a mother, how a mother could allow for her husband to do this to her children, to grape her children. And the rate at which the, these this SA was happening, she would have almost had to have been aware, you know? Um, Jose, in my opinion, for Kitty, and again, I don't know these people. This is just my speculation based on my research, listening to multiple podcasts from people who knew them. I think Jose was kind of like Kitty's kryptonite. I think she was like addicted to Jose going back from her college years, her university years, where she fell in love with this tall, dark, handsome man with an accent. You know, I don't blame her. He was a tall, dark, handsome man with an accent. And she kind of fell for that. And then he became a, I'm sure he was charismatic. I'm sure that there was something very alluring about him. And then they got married and then he started to build this empire. And I think in the beginning of their relationship, there probably was a lot of love bombing. Um, and I'm not trying to excuse Kitty's behavior at all. Some of the stories that we hear about Kitty from her friends and family, it's very concerning. She obviously herself was not a good person. Um, she was still a person, but she there's some questionable behaviors of hers as well. But the rate at which she enacted certain abuses, ABUSC on her children is not the same rate in which Jose did it. And it makes me wonder, I've talked recently a lot about traumatic narcissism and traumatic narcissism is basically a victim of narcissistic abuse starts to act as a narcissist, even though at their core, they're not. So they learn to behave like a narcissist in order to survive in the environment they're in. And I wonder about that with Kitty sometimes. Like, I wonder if Kitty had married somebody else that was healthier, 
that uh, was treated her well and al allowed her to be her and loved her and was faithful to her, how then would Kitty have been towards her children in that marriage? I mean, that's a hypothetical situation that obviously we're never going to know, but that's just kind of what I wonder with Kitty. And um, Kitty became, Kitty was so obsessed with Jose. So, and that, that's something that narcissists do do, right? They love bomb you and then they knock you off the pedestal. And so you're, you're constantly clamming to, to get back on that pedestal and to be love bomb again. And you think you've done something wrong. So, so narcissists keep you kind of destabilized. And if Jose is making all this money and is affording Kitty this luxurious life beyond anything that Kitty had grown up with, Was she free to divorce him? I mean, nowadays, yeah. I mean, California, I don't know what California was like in the 80s and the 90s, but I know now it's it's a no-fault state. Like, in Georgia, Georgia's a fault state. So, like, if Kitty and Jose lived in Georgia, she could have totally divorced his ass and taken his whole estate from him. She could have had the proof of the affairs, proof of what he was doing to her children, and she literally would have got taken everything from him because Georgia is a fault state. People are at fault. My mother, I believe, walked away with like 70% of my father's assets when they got divorced. You know, Georgia don't play like California plays. So I I, I have I, I wonder if Kitty, Kitty also kind of neglected to acknowledge what was happening in her house because to do so would mean to A, go against Jose, and that's like her drug. You know, Jose is her kryptonite. It's a thing that she's the most obsessed with. Um, that gives her that sense of self. And it potentially would have been to walk away from this luxurious life that she had become accustomed to. Now, Kitty, towards the end of her life, was completely addicted to um, D-R-U-G-S. I know I can't say that word that much. Um, pills. Um, she was an alcoholic. And she had threatened or tried to unalive herself like three times. I think in one case that one of the boys found the letter. So this woman was incredibly mentally unstable and very dependent upon a husband who frankly was not good to her at all. And so from that perspective, Kitty becomes interesting. Again, I don't think she was a good person. I think she did a lot of damage to her sons, but she's still interesting nonetheless, right? Again, two things can be true. She could be a victim. She could have been the first victim in the family of Jose Menendez, but that doesn't mean that she herself doesn't become an accomplice with the person that is hurting her as well. Does that make sense? You know, we hear that from the boys that their intimate, the, the way they were violated with their father started off like after tennis lessons, he would call them in and give them a massage. They would take showers together. I'm not going to go into too much detail because of, again, YouTube, all that information is out there. Um, they were taught how to do here. Um, this was called a um, massage of this particular organ that men have and women don't have. Um, and then it turned into actual physical intimacy. Um, starts with an S that you do to men. I mean, the stories that these boys told were absolutely horrific, that they told about the stuff that they had gone through with their father. And it, it's interesting, because again, I think I, I think back to Kitty. Um, when, li when little boys, you know, I have two nephews. And right now, my youngest nephew is still a baby. So he has to be like bathed by adults. And I bathed my oldest nephew a lot when he was a baby in the sink, like would bathe him. And I remember when Charlie was born, because my family, my dad has two sisters. My mom has three sisters. I have a sister. My stepdad has two daughters. Like we're a family of girls. We don't have many. I have some boy cousins, but for us, we didn't grow up with like little boys. And when Charlie was born and now my mom and myself and my sister, you know, especially my sister has a son, there's a lot of stuff we didn't know about boys and their boy bits, right? And I remember when uh, 
my sister took Charlie for a checkup when he was really little. The doctor like basically told my sister she she was bathing him, but she wasn't cleaning as well as she could, but she was nervous. She didn't know how to clean it. Cause like, you know, it's, it's, we don't have boys in my family. So, and, and I remember that as, as an aunt, as his aunt, I had one night I was babysitting Charlie as he was an infant and I was bathing him in the sink. And I remember like looking down at this infant being like, I don't know how to do this. Like, I don't know. This is weird. I don't want to do this. Like, this is very strange trying to bathe this baby because we weren't used to it. Right. With that being said, I know as little boys grow up, like my nephew now is 11. He's about to be 12. God, I can't believe he's about to be 12. Um, my sister doesn't, she hasn't bathed him in a very long time. If he needs help bathing, my brother-in-law helps him now because he's, he's a kid. He's a preteen now, you know, he's not a baby anymore. He doesn't want his mom in there. You know, that's inappropriate. And my point in saying this is like when Eric and Lyle were little boys, I'm trying to like understand from Kitty's perspective, like when they were seven, six, seven, eight years old and this inappropriate behavior started with their father, could it have been a misunderstanding at first with Kitty that she, if, if Jose was in the shower with his kid, you know, I might think, okay, if that's my, my partner and our son, then, you know, he's helping our son, you know, I'm the woman, I'm the mom. So my husband, my, the baby daddy, he's the one that's going to show the boys like how to clean themselves, right? Maybe it's more appropriate. Um, at that age, when you start to become aware that you are different from your mom or your sisters, you know, at a certain age, like, you know, when they're, when kids are really, 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 really little, you can like my, my oldest nephew, and my oldest niece are like, not, are like a year apart. And when they were really little, they would take baths. We would bathe them together in the bathtub because they were so little. That they had no idea that they were even really different from each other. They would just play with their toys in the bathtub and we would bathe them. And then, you know, they were so little, but now that they're older, they don't do that anymore. They haven't done that together in a long time. So do you guys, I, I feel like I'm blabbing on, but do you guys understand what I'm saying? Like there's some gray area here. And I think when, the showers first started, maybe Kitty was under the impression that her husband was showing their sons how to bathe themselves as a man, right? That a woman really can't, you know, as a, as a, as a preteen adolescent daughter, my mother would come in the bathroom when, when my sister and I were bathing, you know, to teach us how to shave our legs, all that kind of stuff. You know, when you get your period, your mom's got to show you like how to you know, so it's different. It's different. And, and even for me now, like at 41 years old, if my mother had to see me naked, I wouldn't care because it's my mom, you know, um, it wouldn't matter to me. So my dad, no, absolutely not. I don't want my dad seeing me naked, but my mom at 41, I wouldn't, you know, does that make sense? I hope I'm making sense. So I'm trying to kind of understand Kitty's perspective. Like maybe in the beginning, she just, it could be excused away that Jose was just helping their young boy boys learn how to be men and how to have hygiene, uh, hygiene as men, you know? And, um, but because at the rapid rate at which this was happening, she would have had at some point to realize what was going on. And I can't help, but logically, and I, I, I want to be careful how I say this too, because I don't mean any disrespect, but I'm just looking at this case and trying to, again, figure out, again, Kitty. There would have had to have been blood. I hate to be blunt about that, but for the inser insertion to happen, there would have had to have been blood. There would have had to have been evidence on the clothes that she probably folded or washed. I know they probably had housekeepers, but even with housekeepers, I think you would be aware your housekeeper would probably say something to you if your children's underwear was soiled or, you know, that's concerning. Even if it isn't something that like graping going on, maybe it's just a sickness that that's concerning. That's the colon attachment. Is there something going on with the colon? Do the kids need to go to the doctor, you know, um, and, and for those kids not to be brought to the doctor and for that evidence that I'm pretty sure was there, if the fact that, that was never acknowledged or questioned 
in my opinion, tells me that Kitty knew exactly what was going on. Now, is it because Kitty knew that Jose had potentially sold his soul to this particular religion? I don't know. Part of me thinks she didn't know that he was trying to get his way into the establishment. But part of me thinks maybe she did. And, and, but if she didn't know, but she had to keep quiet about what was going on with her children is that why she was so addicted to pills and booze I, I, the psychology behind kitty is just incredibly fascinating to me and again I, I don't you know i'm not a parent myself but again i am an aunt and so the closest thing that i can compare children too is my own feelings for my nephews and my nieces and there is nothing that i would not do for those children if someone was hurting them, I would want to take care of that. If I was with a partner that was mean to them, I would leave that partner. There's nothing that I would do to not protect them. So for Kitty to not protect her own children and to be obviously showing signs of distress and trauma herself is really fascinating to me. And I think one of the boys actually even said that she loved the money too much there she couldn't be a mother because she loved the money too much now it was lyle that actually as i alluded to lyle is the one that made accusations against his mother for also being violent towards him and and, 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 and inappropriate when he was 11 to 13 years old he explains about how his mother with nothing on got into bed with him and wanted him to like you know touch her basically i'm trying to be careful about how much i say he claimed that with her he also claimed that she would like kick him from room to room and i don't get this you guys i was talking to somebody about this yesterday i did not i mean i grew up in a pretty toxic family as well and there was definite like essay going on and stuff like that but there was no i didn't grow up in a family that hit like we didn't, I didn't, that, that did not grow up with that. Like my sister and I never like hit each other. Like we never, so the fact that there are families where this happens on a regular basis is baffling to me, is baffling to me. Um, but I can't help but wonder, cause I actually, I believe Lyle, if she, th that physical kicking and grabbing by the hair, if that, if that wasn't a part of her childhood, that she translated onto her children, right? That's maybe what her dad did to her. I don't know. I'm, this is me speculating. I don't know. It's just the complexities of the human mind is just something that I think we'll be studying for the rest of our, our existence as humans because it's, it's complex. It's, it's confusing. We also know that Kitty was aware of what was happening to her sons because of the testimony of two of the cousins of Lyle and Eric. Diane Vander Molen is a first cousin of Lyle and Eric. And she claims that in 1976, so in 1976, Eric was six and Lyle was eight years old. And she claims that while she was spending the night at her aunt and uncle's house with her cousins, that the boys confided into her what was going on and asked her, if her dad did this to her allegedly she then went and confronted her aunt kitty about this but it was never kitty just kind of dismissed it it was never um there was never any further investigation into the claims of of these children we also know that their cousin andy cano spoke spoke about the the massages massages that the boys talked about getting so he was aware that there was something going on and then there were pictures that were brought up in the first trial that were inappropriate of these little boys now there is another picture that wasn't shown in the trial that i'm going to show right now that i noticed when i was just doing research myself because obviously that the pictures that were shown in the trial would be considered cp and so they're not available online, which I absolutely agree with. I know people might say that's censorship, but you know, when, when children are involved, like that's not fair. They don't need to be online. 
Uh, but there is another picture that I came across when I was doing research and looking at pictures of Lyle and Eric when they're little boys. And I did notice something in this particular picture that I thought was really gross and really inappropriate. But it might be something that people miss when they first see this picture, especially if they're not looking for signs of SA. And so I'm going to show that picture now. Let me know. Don't put what you see in the picture, but let me know if you notice it in the picture as well. Now, according to the boys, leading up to the night of the unaliving of August 20th, and they were in dire straits, they literally felt like their life was about to come to an end. Now, a lot of people have questioned the psychology behind this because they were old enough to go out on their own. And I understand what people are saying, like, was it diabolical for them to do this to their parents? And I, I don't know. Maybe it was. But I, will, I do know a thing or two about psychological torment. Just because you as an outsider looking in can definitely see a way out doesn't mean that they could see a way out. These boys had been, I, I, like, for example, I struggle a lot with freeze response. Like that's, I struggle a lot with freeze response, but I've been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder from what I, how I grew up. So I definitely understand mentally where these boys were. What seems like a clear path that they could just leap they could go get a job. They had connections. They could start supporting themselves. They had each other. They had family members who believed them and supported them. Just because we see that in, in somebody who's been massively tormented, they don't see that because they have become dependent upon the person who is violating them. That is a deep psychology that I definitely am not qualified to get into, but I definitely understand it. And so I really want people to understand just because you see a clear exit for these boys does not mean these boys see a clear exit. Now, these boys grew up richer than most of us will ever even comprehend. We're talking about wealth that you find in the 1%. Yeah. So these boys had been accustomed to a lifestyle that most of us are not accustomed to. And that could be part of it as well. Now, this does not mean that they were like kitty and they stayed because they loved the money. This is probably because they felt like their only chance of survival physically was to stay because their father was the one that was financially providing for them. When you've grown up and you don't know that there are other options that you can go and rent an apartment for cheap or there are places hospitality houses, shelters you can go to when you don't know that. And you the 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 consequence of perhaps leaving your family could result in you being homeless. And you don't know. You've never been taught like how to work a menial job in order to provide for yourself, then I can definitely see how you would feel trapped. You would feel trapped and plus the anger and the hurt physical hurt, the emotional hurt, the mental hurt that you have gone through your whole life in the hands of your father could definitely, definitely cause a lot of resentment. And at the point of the unaliving, it is alleged that Jose would threaten his kids that they were, he was going to cut him out of the will, all that kind of stuff, because they weren't doing what he wanted them to do. And I, again, I, even though there was some behavior problems coming from the Menendez brothers, I think those behavior problems very much stemmed from their reaction to the trauma they were going through it was a call for help. Just like Kitty, if you had taken the Menendez brothers and placed them in another house with a healthy family, they probably would not have done any of the things that they did, including the unaliving. They probably would not have been breaking into people's houses. They probably would have been very healthy boys who did the right thing and you know i think this was just they were just uh victims of their circumstance if you will so the night of the the unaliving uh, again august 20th of 1989 kitty and jose and again they 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 plus they say that they were afraid for their lives and i i believe them i think they were afraid for their lives they've seen the rage of their father right they walked into the very famous menendez house and kitty and 
Jose were in the TV room. And I remember this from the 80s and the 90s. Now we have like TVs in every room because you got TV on your phone. But in the 80s and the 90s, for those who are young, we had like TV rooms. Like we had a TV room. So they were in the TV room. This was more like the den, not the living room, the fancy living room, but the den. And they were watching TV where they were literally to death. Now, people say that's diabolical because they were asleep. How can it be self-defense if they were asleep? But this is, again, where it gets nuanced and complicated. Yeah. Now, after it happened, they do say that the boys kind of hung around the Beverly Hills mansion waiting for the police to show up because they thought for sure, for sure the neighbor heard, for sure the neighbor heard what was going on. But when the police didn't show up, they actually went out and tried to go buy a movie ticket for the Batman movie that was out in order to have an alibi. But the only problem is the ticket didn't work because they couldn't backdate the time. You know, like maybe it would have been better if they had bought the ticket beforehand. But nonetheless, they had the ticket and then they started, they just tried to go to Santa Monica to like a food tasting event to have like people saw them there. It's an alibi, right? When they came back to the house, the police still hadn't been called. And so Lyle and Eric decided that they were going to call the police themselves and claim that they had just gotten home and this, and it, this is what they walked into. The first suspects for the Los Angeles Police Department were um, the mob. They thought that Jose and Kitty, because of their wealth, I guess because of the way Jose looked, maybe it's typecasting on the LAPD, it's the stereotyping, they thought that this must have been a mob hit. But over the next few months, the police did start to suspect that there was a possibility that Lyle and Eric were behind this crime. It's kind of funny because if you look at all the victims that Jose Menende Menendez actually had out there that we know of now, there would have been a lot of suspects if the, if the police had been aware of all the victims of the Menendez, of, of, of Jose, of RCA records, allegedly, I'll say. Um, and the media tried to portray, after their arrest, the media tried to portray that Lyle and Eric unalive their parents in order to have access to the money. Now, again, Lyle and Eric weren't sure if they were going to be given the money. Now, with that being said, in the United States, if you're the child of a very wealthy person and that person doesn't leave their estate to you, nine times out of 10, if you take that, if you contest the will at court, the state will overturn the will and give the child the inheritance anyway. But nonetheless, these were young boys. They wouldn't have known that. And they didn't actually, it wasn't until the will reading that they realized the money was still being left to the boys. So they, when they committed this act, they weren't totally confident that they were going to be inheriting his father's vast wealth. Now, once the inheritance was given out, a lot of the media liked to say, oh, they were spending money like crazy. They were paying for all these trips and using chauffeurs and they were, you know, um, buying Rolex watches and Eric paid for a private tennis instructor. But that was propaganda from the media because here's the thing. And his family testified to this. A lot of the friends testified to this. The money that the Menendez brothers were spending after their father, after they inherited was exactly the same amount of money that was being spent before. So nothing changed in their life. There was not this need to go out and just spend frivolously. Now, for us as regular people or even regular wealthy people, not part of the 1%, 1% they might see the spending as frivolous, but for them it wasn't. Like everything's perspective, right? Depending on where you come from. So family and friends were very quick to say, nah, no, no, that's not correct what the media is saying because these boys... They didn't spend any more money than they normally would spend or were allowed to spend. Now, the media picked up on the fact that they went and bought condos to live in. But would you, like, that's kind of stupid. Because, like, would you want to live in the house that your parents, A, tortured you in, and B, were unalived in? Like, of course they went and bought a condo. If they were looking to be, like, these spoiled brats and spend all this money, why wouldn't they have gone and bought mansions? They bought condos for themselves instead to live in. Um, and so that to me is totally understandable as to why they would go and buy a condo and not just stay at the house. Now, as the police started to really feel like Eric and Lyle were the guilty ones, they did try at one point to put a wire on their friend Craig, Eric's friend. And you do see this in the show Monsters where they go out to dinner and Craig flat out ask Eric if he had anything to do with... Um, 
the Schmurder? And Eric says no. But eventually, Eric would spill the beans to his psychologist. And this actually, this part of the story is downright wild to me. Be careful. If you are a psychiatrist, if you're a doctor, if you work in any type of industry where you have client confidentiality, be careful who you share that confidentiality with. I know sometimes people do share it with their spouses. This is a cautionary tale though. So Eric allegedly went to his psychiatrist, the psychiatrist he had been assigned, the boys had both been assigned by the court when they were found guilty of breaking and entering and unloaded to the psychiatrist and basically told him that he and his brother had done the crime and explained why. Well, at first, the psychiatrist kept it to himself because of client uh, confidentiality. I do think, though, when it comes to stuff like that, you are obligated to tell the court. I don't know. I know different states do things a little differently. But this psychiatrist, y'all, was having an affair at the time, cheating on his wife. And he told his lover what the boys had told him. Because at this point, this was all over the media. So these, it wasn't just some random kid that he was therapying that he was th these boys had become celebrities at this point right and so he tells the, his lover his affair partner that they confess to him well then the psychiatrist dumps his affair partner and so to get back at him hell hath no fury like a woman scorned to get back at him she goes to the police and tells the police and thus the boys ended up being indicted and charged with the unaliving of their parents. Lyle was arrested on March 8th of 1990 and Eric was arrested on March 11th of 1990. The boys still to this day are grown men because they've been in jail for prison for a very long time, maintain that they did this crime out of self-preservation, that they were victims of their parents. And as I stated at the beginning of this episode, the, the reality of their claims have now come to surface with the claims of others, especially the Menendo band, of what Jose Menendez was really doing. And now, in October of 2024, we all kind of sit on pens and needles, wondering if these boys are going to get an appeal and are going to get their conviction overturned. And after all these years, these decades behind bars, are they going to be freed for this crime? Because the court will determine that the crime was justified by what these boys were going through. So again, you guys, join us on Wednesday the night at noon, 12 noon, either on Aquarius Rising Africa or Solutions with Shanti, where we're going to be going through this case. Shanti has some really good opinions on this case. I can't wait to hear y'all's opinions and just be careful in the comment section with how you word this, but yeah, this is where we stand. You guys. All right. Have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon.